We are in what we're calling the greatest story for 2020. So if you're visiting, or maybe this is the first few Sundays, we are now completing the third week of reading through the Bible uh, together. And so uh, just so you know, those of you who are beginning this journey and you have uh, sort of felt the push and the pull of what goes on in your daily life and your weekly life, you're finding some of the challenges that come along with spiritually disciplining your life to follow after Christ. And truly, that's what it means to be a disciple of Christ, right? Is to discipline your life to follow after him. A disciple is one who disciplines their life who draws their life into conformity to what Christ wants for us, it it requires attention. It requires renewed thinking, Romans 12. It requires that we discipline our lives. These children displayed so wonderfully this this morning, uh, displayed for us what it means to understand the Old Testament. They gave us the Old Testament in about a minute or a minute and a half, right? Isn't that outstanding? And uh, so much to learn, and I hope that your journey and this process has been beneficial so far. Just hang in there. You're three weeks into this. You made it through Genesis and Exodus and, and uh, a good part of Exodus, and, and, and you're there. So keep, keep hanging in there. Wednesday nights, our Life 2020 on Wednesday nights is designed to make sure we get all the kids back on the bus together, Right? And we all travel to the same destination together. You know, you ever been that way? I mean, you, you've, had, you've gone on a trip as a family. And you're, you know, if you come from a big family especially, um, you got to like almost count heads. I come from a family of seven. So you got to like, are they here? Where is Joe? You know, whatever. And, uh, and of course, Dustin really knows this story with the youth group at Hot Hearts this weekend. Uh, we got to count heads. We got to make sure everybody gets on the bus together and we're all going to the same destination. That's what we're doing on Wednesday day reading through the scripture together and so well, I can do that on my own and well I would just ask you this so how's it going on your own this year I mean if you're if you're that outstanding then would you please come and talk with us about how you're doing this so well because what I find in my experience as a pastor and a teacher is that through the years is that people who tend to journey alone take this journey alone is that when you get in deep waters as the Old Testament will provide is that you'll get there and you'll feel I don't know what to do just let me hang on to something because it moves fast and furious and there are portions of the Old Testament that you scratch your head and you wonder I didn't know this was here is it should this really be in the Bible but keep this in mind as you're reading the Bible that everything that is there is to authenticate the work of the Lord uh, both here on earth as, as it is in heaven, and to, to authenticate what he is doing. It's describing things that occurred. It's not necessarily prescribing this for us today. Okay, that means there are principles underlying, but there are things that they did back then that we're not going to repeat, right? We're just not going to do that. It tells the whole story, uh, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and it's the good, the bad, and the ugly sometimes. But ultimately, the story... The greatest story is teaching us about the Lord Jesus Christ. I like what J.I. Packard says when it comes to thinking about God. And today I want to talk to you about who is God. J.I. Packard in his classic book, Knowing God. If you haven't ever read this book, it's a, it's a wonderful study, wonderful read, by the way. And if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's certainly a wonderful uh, read indeed. J.I. Packard says this. He says, the most important thing that you can think about is what you think about when you think about God. Okay, let me say that again. The most important thing that you can think about is what you think about when you think about God. In other words, what we think about God makes a huge difference. Contemplating the magnitude of who God is is a tremendous journey indeed. The greatest minds have tried to contemplate the greatness of God of our Lord and have fallen very short. And so it's vital that we come to understand and know who God is. Some have even said, I don't even know if I believe in God. I've had people tell me that, I don't believe in God. Now, not me, but others have said that, right? It's nice to know that your pastor, I do believe in God, right? (laughs) Now my response oftentimes when people tell me that I don't believe in God, is, is I say this to him, tell me what God you don't believe in, and I probably b- don't believe in them either. Because so many ideas that are floating around concerning who God is, are, they're erroneous. 
And people's impressions and feelings and their thoughts about God are not complete or they're astray. Or maybe, maybe they've seen something in religion and religion typically poisons the water, typically. This is the nature of religion. Man-made efforts to somehow know God or to, uh, to approach God. Now, our focus today is not so much about the question whether God exists. We assume, because we're here today, by and large, that we believe in God. We, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take that assumption that we do believe in God. And so our focus today is not really a question about God's existence, but it's about God's nature. Who is he? Who is he? How do we understand him? How can we even know who he is? As a Christian, we need to understand what God has said, and we need to understand how he has revealed himself, because in fact, God has been revealing himself, the nature of revelation, that is Old Testament, New Testament, God disclosing who he is, Psalm 19, that was read earlier, the heavens declaring the glory of God, what is typically called general revelation, or what we can deduce about God from the very things that we see with our natural eye. In the world around us, these things tell us something about God. And yet, God has made himself known, not just generally speaking in the creation that we see, but he's made himself known very specifically to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And so it's our temptation, oftentimes, to define God based upon our feelings, our imaginations, our misconceptions, and a list of many things. And so this is why, in this journey this year, we're using this 12-era of biblical history, these 12 eras that are found in the 30 days to understanding the Bible, we're using it as a framework in our Bible studies or our connect groups on Sunday morning at 9.30 and also in our worship services so that we can sort of hang our thoughts, create a framework by which we can begin to understand what the scripture is actually uh, teaching us. And so this is helping us to develop uh, what, what traditionally is called A theology, what we think about God, is very important. What we think about God when we think about God is very important. And we bring with us to the table these varying ideas about who God, about who God is. And so we want to, we want to understand this large story, this meta narrative, this big picture idea as to who is this God, because If you don't know him, you can't love him. And so knowing him requires that we develop an understanding of who God is. And so it's imperative. We love what we know. We become what we love. So we can't love what we don't know. You can't love God if you don't know God. In fact, the only reason you love God, 1 John tells us, is that We love him because he first loved us. So the capacity to love, which is within the Godhead itself, within the very essence of who God is, is something that is given to us and is something that we can express as we get to know him. So these grand feelings of love need to be anchored in biblical truth and reality, and this is where we're headed this morning. So you you say, well, we we can't love what we don't know. That's true. We have to know who he is. And so when we start in the very beginning in Genesis 1, I want you to take your Bible there. We're going to read, and you'll have on the screen a number of verses, okay, that are designed. We're going to go through many verses, and I'm asking that you pray that once again I can stay the course and be disciplined and do some teaching this morning that will help us and do some exhortation and preaching toward the end, right? So Genesis 1, 1, these first two verses tell us something Moses, writing the first five books of the Old Testament, assumes the existence of God. God is not debatable in Moses' mind. God has revealed himself. Moses writes these words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So who is this God? that Moses writes about, that Jesus consistently talks about in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, you'll note that in Jesus' mind, in his relationship with the Father, that he sees sees him as Father. 
And over and over and over, this God that Moses writes about is a very personal and intimate God who desires to have relationship with the very ones that he has created. So who is God? God is eternally exists. I'm going to give you a few definitions. They might see it. I'm a little heavy or heady, but hang in there with me, okay? So God eternally exists as one essence, yet three distinct persons. One essence, but yet three. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Each of them is fully God. They are distinct, yet they are one. We see the Father in Genesis 1. We see the Spirit, as we'll come to in just a moment, hovering over the waters, a reference to the Holy Spirit. And when you read John's Gospel, we'll get to it in a little while, you'll see very clearly that, that John understood that Jesus himself was there in creation. Colossians will tell us the same thing. So I'm rushing ahead and I'm lacking a little discipline right now, but stay with me, okay? So we want to get to know who this God is. Now, why am I raising this question? This is more of a topical kind of study this morning, not in any singular passage of Scripture, but there were many passages, which I typically don't do. I typically like to stay in one passage of Scripture. But because we're, we're hanging our thoughts on, in this framework, this theology of God, this systematic approach, what others would call the systematic theology, we're trying to develop a way for trying to grasp the magnitude of this infinite God, this little pea brain of mine and yours, okay? It is trying to wrap itself around this, this magnificent God that we worship. And who is he? He's completely unified. There's, there's no separation between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's no, like, there's no difference of opinion between the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We see them throughout the scriptures, distinct as, as persons, distinct, unique in their role, and unified in their purpose, okay? And so in terms of their equality, there's no debate that we don't have God the Father, God the Son here, and God the Holy Spirit down here. You know, Baptists got, you know, got the Holy Spirit a little bit later on, right? So it's like, well, we, we got we to gotta make room for the third person of the Godhead. That's sort of what has sort of been the joke. And, and, and that is because all three are equal, distinct yet equal. They're not lesser than. Distinct, unique in their role, unique in their purpose, equal in worth and glory and praise. And in every regard, we are told to worship the Lord God. We are worship him as, as our creator. We are told to worship him as the Lord, as the Lord of lords and the King of kings. We are, told, we are told to worship in spirit and in truth. And on and on, we are encouraged to worship the Lord. So God delights. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. God's delights. Deuteronomy 6, 4 says this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In other words, there's unity in the Godhead. This God that we worship, Moses is saying, he is one. Not singular in the sense that he alone exists, but he is one. There is a unity between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Father conceives of the creation. The Son creates. The Spirit completes. And so God, de God delights together. The Father loves and he delights. So the Father delights in his Son. Now, I, I want you to think with me today, okay? I want you to try to comprehend some of these things. And your measure and your understanding, your knowledge your, of content concerning God may increase by two measures today. But I pray that your communion with God will, commu will, will increase by 10 measures, okay? So you know that if you receive two measures of instruction and knowledge concerning him, if you, if you move the ball a little bit further down the field today than what it was just last week concerning what you know about God, what you will walk away with is a greater knowledge of who he is and understanding of who he is, and consequently, the content of what you know about God will be magnified by the way in which you worship him and the communion that we experience because we can't love someone that we don't know. You, we, just, we just can't do it. I love my wife. And uh, I, I mean, I do. 
I mean, if she's 6'3", a tremendous swimmer. Uh, she loves motorcycles and had a career in teaching science for many, many years. Her, she is really known for her famous oatmeal cookies. Now, if you know my wife, everything I just said is not true. Okay, you know that you're thinking, no, that's not true. She's really known for those chocolate chip cookies. And she was a kindergarten teacher. Not 6'3", by the way, 5'3". Okay? But you would have thought, well, that's foolish. You don't even know your own wife. How can you love her? Right? How can we love a God that we don't know? If we know him, we will love him. By the way, that's a great point for us in terms of our human relationships as well with our spouse. And so this is, this is very important. So if we're looking to define who God is, I mean, wow, I mean, we need to tread lightly in this area because we're trying to grasp or define who God is. And understanding who God is requires that we understand him in light of his relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the only way. We are, in a sense, we, we believe in a very a Trinitarian view of God. It's, it's uniquely Christian. It's unique. It's what, it's what delineates uh, our faith from every other religion, ultimately, in the world. And so we believe in this triune God, this Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who, who, are, who are working in unison and working in unity, and everything that they do is... Because they love one another. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. The Son loves the Spirit. The Spirit magnifies the Son. And you, know, and you see this relationship, and you get that by not just a single passage of Scripture, but the reason I'm talking about this today is so that we, as we, as we read together, as we move forward together, we can begin to, we can, we, we can, we can think through what we think about God in such a way that, that the Scripture will enlighten us and inform us and will instruct us concerning who the Lord is. God delights in His Son. The Father delights in His Son. The Son delights in the Father and so forth. God does all things through His Son. Genesis 1, we've just read that passage of Scripture. So what do we see in Genesis 1? We see that God creates. When you read the Gospel of John, you see clearly in John 1 that that by Christ, these things were created. So we see God in creation. We see him in preservation. Let me go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. Now, this may be hard to track all these verses because of, of, of how we're doing it this morning. But hang in there, if you will. And it, it's on the screen. And he, speaking of Christ, is before all things. And in him, all things hold together in Christ. He's before all things, in him all things are held together. So if you're, if you're tracking with me on this, is that in Christ all things are preserved. So Jesus is in creation, he's also in preservation. If it were not for the love of Christ for us, we would not exist. He sustains us. In him all things are being held together. Wonderful principle, by the way, of when you take Jesus out of the equation, when you take Jesus out of the center of your world, your life, your business, your marriage, your relationship with people, mark it down. Invariably, the law of God is that if Christ is taken out of it, it begins to fragment and deteriorate. But when Christ is at the center, it all works well. That's what Colossians is talking about. Now, I'm going to have to be careful about how much preaching I do here. But nonetheless, creation, Christ is in creation. He's also in preservation, but he's in salvation. John 3, 16, a verse that probably all of us know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus, before creation, in creation, holding it all together, and now providing salvation. That's the Jesus that we worship. A father who has conceived all things because he is Elohim, the God who has created all things that we see. But there is the son who, has, who creates and is a part of that creation. He's also very intricate and very involved in our mediation in John chapter 1. In John 1, in verse 1. And so in John, in John 1, in verse 1, we see, let me get there. In the beginning was the word, the word, this is a reference to Jesus, okay? You seen it on the screen there? 
In the beginning was the Word, Jesus, the Logos. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. The life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You, you see what John's saying? That there is this one, Jesus, the Logos, the Word, used seven times in Scripture. He's present. He's there in mediation, in creation, fashioning all things. He's there as the one who is mediating this relationship between the Father and us. There is this Jesus, this one, the Son of God, who's come to dwell among us, and he is mediating this relationship. Now, uh, there's a great deal happening in these verses of Scripture, but know this. In the Greek mind, the Greek understanding of, of how the world came to be, the Greeks thought, well, there was, there was this divine principle that organized the world. They could not and did not know uh, that it was personal. They thought it was mainly this organizing principle for the world, and that was the Logos. The Greeks thought, well, there's, there must be some, just sheer logic will at least get me to that point, at least, you know, help me take a few steps in this, and that is that there's this, must be this organizing principle that has brought all things into some form or order. And the, in, the, in the Hebrew mind, the Hebrew mind was there, there must be not only some principle by which all things are organized in the world but there is this power evident that we see just in the world as we observe it with the natural eye but john takes us a little bit further he takes a secular term the word logos and he infuses this biblical understanding this christian understanding into it and he says listen there's more than a principle there's more than some impersonal power that exists organizing and shaping this world. No, there is this person. His name is Jesus. You can know him. You with me on this? Now, am I getting too heady for you there? Hang in there. You don't have to catch it all today, okay? You can listen to this next week on a podcast or something. I mean, you know, you can listen to it on the internet. Listen to it over and over and over. It helps. It helps me too, by the way. So there, there is Christ in creation and mediation, but there's also Christ in Colossians chapter 1. There is Christ who images for us and helps us to understand who the Father is in heaven. Now, you have that passage, it's Colossians 1.15. He, speaking of Jesus, this is what Paul writes, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. The word image just simply means he's imaging for us. Jesus came down to this earth to display for us an understanding of who the Father is in heaven. There is no way we can know the God who is above apart from his visitation with us through his son. And this is what he does. He images for us or visualization so that now we see. Jesus said this, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Right? So what was he saying? He was communicating to them God's intent for their life and that God had come to visit with them. And so not only that, but we see it in representation. Jesus says this in John chapter 10 in verse 30. In John 10 and verse 30, a very short verse, he says, I and the Father are one. What does he mean? There's unity. Nothing that you will know about me is a contradiction concerning the Father. Nothing about the Father that you know uh, is a contradiction of me. In other words, they're all working in unison. It's all together. Now, it's important that we try to grasp some of these things. And so here we see Christ representing the Father who is above. Now we see God the Holy Spirit as well. And if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, you see very clearly in that same passage of Scripture, in verse 2, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So what do we know about the Holy Spirit? He was there. He, not it, not some impersonal power. So when you talk about God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, know this. When you're thinking about the Holy Spirit, we're not talking about someone lesser. It's not like he got, like, he was third team and, you know, he was brought in, right? Like, you know, we're going to bring in some reinforcements. We're going to bring in the third teamer here. That's not what we're talking about with the Holy Spirit. We're talking about someone who is equal with the Father. They are unified in all that they do, in all that they conceive, in all that they create, and ultimately, all that the Spirit completes. 
by design in creation and all that he has for us. And so he creates with the Father, Genesis 1. He applies salvation, speaking of the Holy Spirit. Look at Ephesians 2, verse 22. Ephesians 2 and verse 22. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So what do we know? We know this, that the Holy Spirit comes to fill us and empower us. This is what Acts 1, Acts 1 8 tells us as well, that he, in, he indwells us. The Holy Spirit indwells us and em, empowers us, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So here we have the Holy Spirit, not a lesser than, but working all together. Why is this important? Because we see this interaction between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We, we see all of this occurring in such a way so that we can grasp who he is and begin to comprehend who he is. So he goes on to say in Ephesians, Paul says in Ephesians 5, verse 18. Ephesians 5 and verse 18. No, I, I missed this. You go, go back to Ephesians 1.13. That was, that's, thank you, Colin. Ephesians 1.13, this is so good. Because remember last week we talked about how the Holy, how, how the Lord shut, he shut Noah up in the ark. He sealed them in the ark. Remember that story? Anybody read that story? Just, just, just this right here. I, I know if you're reading the Bible or not. I want to know, put your hands up there. If you read the story, it tells you he shut him up in the ark. But then you read over here in Ephesians chapter one and look what the Holy Spirit does for us. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed in him, you were sealed by the promise, sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. So what happens is this. When you believe in Jesus, you are sealed. What God conceived of what Jesus has created and brought to us in terms of our salvation the Holy Spirit seals and nothing can change that Amen. nothing can change that now I mean if you want to be wishy-washy in your Christianity I'm, I'm gonna have to preach for a minute if you want to be wishy-washy in your Christianity I'm saved today I'm lost tomorrow I'm saved today I'm lost tomorrow I don't know and you know and pretty soon you're just an emotional uh, basket case you can anchor your emotions your sense of knowing and the fact that the Spirit of God seals you, you are a child of God if you believe in Jesus. Amen. Romans 8 says, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're adopted into his family. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. The Spirit of God comes not only to seal you, but to empower you. And that's where I was headed in Ephesians 5 and verse 18 because the Scripture says this. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit of God. So we need the Spirit of God to seal us, and we need the Holy Spirit of God to fill us so that we can live this thing called the Christian life. You know why this Christianity thing is like a ball and chain for some of you? You know why? Because you're not filled with the Spirit of God. I'm just being honest with you. You're not filled with the Spirit of God. You drag around your religion. It's poisonous. Nobody, it's not contagious for sure. I mean, in a, in a positive sense of that, nobody wants it because it's like, oh my, oh, we gotta do this again, you know? Be concerned about your teenager, by the way. I know every teenager has their moment, but if it's a reoccurring thought in their life and you say, hey, but they got baptized when they were six years old. Okay, yeah, but where's the fruit? Where's the desire? Is there ever a desire? Has there been a desire? Do you see any evidence? Because the Spirit of God comes to live within us, empowering us to become something that in and of ourselves we can't become. So the Spirit of God is so critical. He is so critical in what God wants for our life. So, in short form, you'll be reading about this God this year who is great, the second major point I want to make, he is great and he is good and he is gracious and he is glorious. Very quickly, great he is. Psalm 24, Psalm 24. God is great. There's no one like him. A Psalm of David, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. In other words, he's on this level. We're on this level. There's nobody like him. God is great. He, he is sovereign. He's eternal. He, he's self-existent. You know, God, God didn't show up because somebody created him. God has, 
He has no need, you know, understand that. God, by the way, God didn't create us because he had a need within him. Something inherently was missing in the Godhead or missing within him. He said, you know, I'm gonna create humanity because I'm sort of missing something. He didn't even primarily create us for the fellowship. He created us because he loves us. He creates because he loves. Where love exists, creativity exists. You know, if you love your wife, you love your spouse, the creativity sort of follows. Just a little extra. It's Valentine's pretty quick. This God who loves us and loves created us. That's who he is. One of, one of the most... Um, and I don't want to just mesmerize you, but, but I want you, this is a wonderful book, by the way. I, I rarely do this, okay? You know, you know that. If you come here week by week, you know I don't bring up books and all this, but, but, but I'm going to die trying, okay, to equip you and train you and teach you the Word of God. I, I'm going to at least die trying, okay? If you find me dead in my office over there, just know he tried. <laughs> he didn't always get us there, but he tried. This is a wonderful book. It's called Delighting in the Trinity. Wonderful, wonderful book because it helps you to try to wrap your mind around some of these really hard things, to be honest with you. But if we don't try, if we don't think about what we think about concerning God, then, then pretty soon what happens is we get these crazy notions about him. We develop these bumper sticker theologies and we just sort of, you know, little plaque theologies or little post-it note theologies or little things that we pick up from wherever and that's how we develop our understanding concerning God. And yet our task, our goal, our responsibility, your challenge, your commitment that you are three weeks into is that I don't just want to read the Bible. I want to commune with the God of the Bible. I want to commune with him. I want to get to know him. He knows me. But I want to get to know him. He is great. He is sovereign. He is good. Inherently, God is good. There's a great deal of question concerning the goodness of God. In other words, all these evil things are happening in the world today. How can there be a good God if all these things are allowed to occur? The question is asked so oftentimes by people who ultimately want to put down, push down any notion of a loving God. We worship a loving God. You know that, right? He is a loving God. The fact that he would act and he would respond to us, he is good toward us. He is splendid. Deuteronomy 32, uh, verses 3 and 4. L look, at, look at what Moses writes here. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord. I will ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work is perfect. For all of his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity. Just and upright is he. That's a mouthful. That's the God we've been told to proclaim. I'm going to ascribe those things to him. When I speak of him, those are the things I'm going to proclaim. This is marvelous. The God of justice, the God of righteousness, and a God truly who is good. God who is willing to give of himself. You know how we know the goodness of God? In so many ways. But in at least one way we know because God is benevolent. He's benevolent. There is nobody you know right now that's been better to you than him. No one, no one has been better to you than what God has been. You're here, aren't you? <sighs> Take a deep breath. You did that, didn't you? You're six feet above, not below. And just continue to name the things. God's goodness toward us is a marvelous thing, and we will proclaim it. God's graciousness toward us. Ephesians 2, verse 4. Ephesians 2, verse 4. This is a marvelous passage of Scripture as well, because Paul writes this, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Oh, you see that? The, the God who is rich in mercy toward us. We were dead in our sins. We were hopeless. We were on the fast track of getting nowhere. 
and God intercepted our lives. Now that's the... That's the graciousness of God in salvation. And then the gloriousness of God. He is satisfying indeed. John 6, verse 35. John 6, verse 35. He satisfies us. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. God is glorious indeed. And he is infinitely satisfied with himself. And because he is satisfied with self, he is able to disperse that satisfaction to us because of his glorious nature. That's who he is. There's a few other things I want us to consider. And thank you for your patience this morning, but I'm going to finish this message, okay? And I'm going to try very hard to move quickly through these last ideas, God's uniqueness. And I want us to go to a psalm Psalm 113, and I want to read this psalm for you. It is a beautiful psalm, and one that, again, as I was reading last night, it spoke to Cheryl and I in very personal ways, and I hope will do the same thing for you. God is unique. How is he unique? He's, he's, he's far, and yet he's near. This God is holy, and yet he loves us. He's just, doesn't give a pass on sin, but he's gracious. He is, it's a big term, he's transcendent. He is out there, but he's imminent. He's right here. So different. High and low, king and servant, Listen to what the psalmist says, beginning in verse 4, after a declaration, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, blessed be the name of the Lord. Verse 4, the Lord is high above the nations, and his glory is above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and on the earth? He raises the poor from the dust, and he lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes. With the princes of his people, he gives the barren woman a home making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The psalmist writes psalm after psalm after psalm. They're saying, this God is incredible. That we, He's unique. There's nobody like him. We worship someone who is uniquely himself. Don't throw him in there with the, in, in, in the box with all these other gods. In Islam... And Judaism, there is a notion that God is high and that he's holy. And that the only way you can come to him is by way of submission. So he is high and holy in, in Islam and in Judaism. But they miss the sense of the God who is there has come down to dwell among us. This is the incarnation. And he came, John 1, 14, and he pitched the tent among us. He tabernacled among us. The God who is holy is loving and he has come down here to dwell in our midst. In Buddhism and Hinduism, God is low. He's everywhere. He's near. You can find him here and there and just about every place you want to look. And so there's a sense in which God is here, but there's no sense in which he is wholly other and transcendent. He is, there's this missing component. They don't see the uniqueness of God in that way. In atheism and agnosticism, in atheism, God is nowhere, <laughs> right? In agnosticism, it's just that God doesn't want to be found. He's out there, but you can't really know who he is. He's not personal. But the God of Christianity is high, and he is holy, and he is the one that fills the pages of Scripture. He is the one who so loved us that he created us. He so loved us that when he saw us broken and bent on doing our own thing and establishing our independence apart from him, he still sent his son. That's that God. That's the God that we should know, that we should understand, that we should worship today. And so we, we are, in so many ways, we are, we are hardwired this way. We know there's something missing in our lives. We know it is. There's this 
God-shaped vacuum place. It's missing. And the only person who can fill it, the only person who can fill it is the Lord. Jeremiah the prophet, he said this. Um, in Jeremiah 9, in verse 23, He said, thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. So if you're sitting out there and saying, listen, I, this is, you're, con, you're, you're on, if you, if you knew as much as science knew, if you know as much as what we know and what we've recently discovered, and we have, you know, we certainly, we have arrived at a greater place today. This notion of God has got to be absurd, right? you still hanging on to something of so archaic, mythological ideas about some concept of another person that can hold you up. Like one of the popular athletes has done here recently, to, you know, like God is a crutch or something for us. Yeah, I, I'll take my crutches. But he's more than a crutch. When it all falls apart in your life, where are you going to turn? To no one. To no one. You, in, you elevate your intellect and you elevate what you've achieved and what you've obtained because you think you can think better and greater than somebody else down the road. You think your thoughts are greater than God's thoughts. That's why you never consider God's thoughts. you got a problem with your own wisdom. You're not submitting your thinking to God's word. I'm telling you, you got a problem. You think you're all that. You believe in God. You believe you're God. You believe yourself to be God. Anyways, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Your strength, your career, your profession, the source of your strength, humanly speaking, Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. All that you have, here, Christians in the West, the United States of America, wealthiest country in the world, and probably in the history of mankind. And we think we have it all. What arrogance. What arrogance. Okay. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and that he knows me. That he, it's the Hebrew word yada, that you know me. Let him boast in that. Give me someone with little, humanly speaking, in terms of intellect or power or wealth. And yet if they know God, they are greater than, and they are certainly sufficient in Christ more than they are in themselves. That he understands and he knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love. I'm loyal. If you knew me, you would know that when you bailed out on me, I didn't bail out on you. That's steadfast loyal love. That's the word hesed. If you knew me, I'm not the one who bailed out on you when you bailed out on me. I am the God who practices steadfast love. I am the God who practices justice. This past Monday, I read letters from the Birmingham jail by Martin Luther King. I've started reading that the last several years. A very important document talking about justice in our land. The Bible says he is the God of justice. And when we do not implement it and when we are wrong and when we mistreat people and we do the wrong thing, let me tell you, God will make things right. He will make things right. He's a God of justice if you know him. And he's also the God of righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. It's a crash landing, but we got to land it. We have to land this. The, the last verse, it's on, it's on your screen. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that, you may, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is eternal life. 
You, you know what eternal life is? This is what the whole Gospel of John was written for. It was written so that we will read the account of the life of Jesus and understand the greatest story ever written, given this epic, this epic story that we have to read that tells us about this, this incredible God who loves us so much that he was willing to send his son to become an atoning sacrifice and there in John 17 in this wonderful prayer that Jesus is talking with his father he calls him father over and over and over and over that you would know this is eternal life do you know Jesus if you don't know him he wants you to he wants you to he wants you to. Let's pray. Lord, you are marvelous, marvelous God indeed. And we worship you. We thank you. Lord, and, and uh, we worship you. We acknowledge that there is no one like you. We realize that there is so much that we don't know. I don't know, certainly trying to just wrap our mind around uh, your greatness, Lord, and who you are, it, it, it overwhelms us. And while you did create this world that we live in, and you do rule, you are sovereign, and you rule the world that we live in, probably the most uh, personal thing about you that you have made known is that you are our Father, you are our Father if we will believe. We will become your sons and your daughters. As your word says in John 1, to as many as received them, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. And we receive you. We believe in you. Lord, for anyone here today that, that they want, they're crying out to you now. They want that relationship with you. They desire to know you. You know them already, but they desire to know you. And the one thing that they've come to know more importantly than anything else today is that you love them and that you died for them, that you gave all for them. And I pray that they would receive that gift of eternal life that you promised to all those who call upon your name. For you did and you do so love this world. We love you in Jesus' name.